morning, and it's great to be here. I honestly don't know who wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't sound like me at all. <laughs> um, I, do, I won't do everything that uh, Dr. Carl just said I was going to do. I mean, what, what, what I'd like to do is, um, I guess, talk a little bit about how we see the future. I mean, when you, know, when, when you put up a title for a symposia like that, you know, Manufacturing 2030 presumes that you can see a bit far ahead into the future. And uh, you know, when I took on this job three to four years ago, the question that everybody asked me all the time is, you know, what is the future of manufacturing? You know, what shall we make and so on? And I, I guess I always thought that the best thing that CSIRO could actually uh, you know, uh, develop is a good crystal ball you know, they can gaze into. And it's not that simple. I mean, over the last four years, I had, you know, when I started, I had certain views about the world, and then, you know, how much things have actually changed in the last, you know, two to three years alone. The speed at which the transformation is happening, the speed at which structural adjustment is happening, uh, is almost unprecedented. Although we, you know, we had that steady decline you know, in the contribution of manufacturing uh, to the national economy, but the rate at which it is changing. Um, and as uh, you know, Yoran and others uh, have laid the context and set the scene you know, that uh, we will continue to see manufacturing change. Um, part of it is that you know, increasing servitization of the economy. Um, people don't necessarily just make things anymore in spite of the rhetoric. You know, manufacturing encompasses a far greater range of activities apart from just making things. You know, it's about knowledge creation and capture. It's about, you know, uh, services associated with the product you know that you make and in many cases people don't make anything at all you know they simply integrate uh, so you make the comp you make the parts where it's best made and then perhaps you know all you do is just integrate so I think all that uh, you know all that uh, is happening and if you read a uh, Ross Gittins article from not too long ago he said you know why worry uh, you know why worry about the, the loss in manufacturing jobs the jobs always come back they just come back in the services sector well, some people will absolutely worry about that, right? So, but you know, the aggregate uh, job growth is still there. But having said that, uh, manufacturing is such a backbone of the economy in ways that people don't understand. So, the loss of the automotive industry, for instance, is not just about the you know the number of people who are going to lose jobs in Holden and Toyota and Ford. It's really about the supply chain, you know, for. The, 30 or 40 firms, the tier one supplies are supplied to the main auto company. There might be, you know, five, six, seven hundred other firms underneath it. And there's the engineering backbone of the country as well. Um, you know, do we have time, you know, to make the transition? But having said all that, you know, I don't think I, I'll probably just be repeating a lot of what uh, Yoran have said anyway. But what I want to do today is uh, simply kind of provide a bit of a a way to look at the future, and rather than say, you know, this is what people should do, it is, but how do you think about the future, uh, and then therefore work it out, and then work out what's missing, okay? So, trends and realities, um, you know, we all know that. Um, most manufacturers are pretty small, so it implies a lack of scale. Uh, most, you know, most manufacturers, you know, uh, you know, they're operating in an increasingly high cost environment. Most of them operate in low to medium tech. You know, some are very heavily export oriented, but only a, only a small portion of uh, manufacturers do that. You tend to find that more export oriented uh, manufacturers are, tend to be more competitive and profitable, and those who are not operate in a finite market here and probably you know, are less competitive. So the world's changing. We all know that. Do firms really have the ability to prepare for that change? So Yoran was emphasizing that there's a role for government in terms of uh, ensuring that there's a favorable or you know environment to help companies grow and thrive. But I think you know companies are ultimately responsible for working out you know where the future is in the first place and then look for the level of support and the skills and all that that, uh, that they require for, for growth. So in CSIRO, uh, over the last few years now, we've done a fair bit of work in foresight. Uh, foresight, I think it's a big, big word, but it's really about having a big bit of a look at the future. And uh, foresight involves what we call evidence-based narratives. And uh, narratives are you know, storylines 
comprising a number of components. You know, uh, it looks at trends, it looks at shocks, uh, it looks at scenarios, uh, you know, disruptive events. It also looks for weak signals, for instance, you know, little indicators about the way that things could evolve. It looks for signposts, which are little markers along the way that confirms you know, that a particular trend is, uh, is emerging. And a bit of predictive uh, modeling as well. So you might have actually heard, uh, well, well just, just before I, I talk about megatrends, so in terms of thinking about the future, so if you look at where we are now and where we might end up in the future, of course, there's much more certainty now. And as we move in the future, there's less certainty. So weather forecast you know, is a typical example. So what you have is over that time horizon, you have a range of you know, probable uh, scenarios. So these are like fairly accurate you know, you know, forecastable uh, events. You have what are possible which is the whole set of potential you know, events or solutions. Of course, you know, the level of uncertainty goes up there. And then you might have what is plausible, which is the balance between, you know, between the evidence and the imagination, as we call it. And perhaps what you want is the preferable scenario. So I think some people say the best way to predict the future is actually to create yourself. And uh, so in terms of you know, a preferable uh, scenario, so what is, the, what, what is our role in charting that course instead of just trying to rely on you know, a, a forecast that's, uh, that, that's very uncertain? How do we actually chart that course to get to a preferred uh, future? And that's you know, a lot of things that uh, Yoran's been talking about in terms of how do we create the environment, you know, how to create the skills, you know, how we create the business models and all that that gives us a more, uh, you know, a more preferable uh, future state. So CSIRO did a little bit of work, well not a little bit, a fair bit of work now, in, it's been two iterations called Megatrends. Uh, the latest publication was a late 2012, you know, called A Future World. So a megatrend is uh, just defined as a particularly important pattern of social, economic, or environmental activity that occurs at the intersection of many trends. So when we do this sort of analysis, you, know, you go through lots and lots and lots of literature, you look for all these trends that seem to be emerging, and, and when you get a clustering of them, and when you get you know, a, 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 a number of uh, clusters of trends kind of intersecting, then a mega trend uh, emerges. And some of them might actually seem fairly obvious. And these are the six that's been identified in the latest uh, iteration of the megatrends. So more from less. So I think to today, uh, uh, I think we've heard a different uh, actually interpreta interpretation of more from less. More from less really relates more to resource efficiency. You know, how do you, how do, you do more from uh, using less resources? But we're talking about that from the productivity context, there's another angle here about more from less. You know, how do you actually become more productive you know, from, from less human capital? So I think more from less is a trend, you know, that's just going to continue. Uh, to keep going, you're seeing that in some of the resources that we use, you, you know, seeing peak production, you know, uh, you know, uh, increasingly poor quality, low yields, and so on, particularly amongst a lot of minerals. Yes, there's a little bit of question mark about uh, fossil fuels, you know, you're now with the shale gas and all that coming from America. Some people are sitting back and say, hey, you know, peak energy, what's the problem? Not a problem anymore, not sure about that. So, but in any case, um, the use of resources, you know, in terms of efficiency, you know, the way we actually look at, you know, whole of life and so on, I think it's going to be much, much more important. And a lot of companies actually do actually uh, find that it makes business sense, you know, be, to be much more resource efficient. Uh, going, going, gone, and that's just about uh, species extinction. I mean, I'm not trying to kind of wave it off, but you know, in today's context, perhaps, you know, uh, we, 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 we're not going to focus on that so much. Uh, Silk Highway, that's pretty much uh, self-evident too. I mean, you know, just the rise of you know, China, India, you know, the brick uh, economies and so on. Uh, forever young, you know, uh, don't we all wish to be forever young? Uh, but uh, you know, we, we all want to live longer, but that actually comes at you know, a, a, a cost as well right, in terms of how, long, uh, how much it takes to keep us all going and also uh, the, the older demographic and, and what they demand. So then the two other uh, megatrends, 
uh, virtually here, which is that uh, convergence, you know, of the physical and uh, digital world uh, that we see is much more pervasive now. And perhaps one that's very important for manufacturers of the future is great expectations. I think uh, people don't buy products just for the functionality alone. People pay a premium for the experiences that, get, that they get out of the product that they buy. And great expectations also talks about consumers' expectations of what businesses do in terms of you know, its behavior, uh, in terms of you know, environmental uh, performance and so on. So great expectation, I think, is one of those big you know, trends that's going to uh, determine you know, how consumers uh, exercise their preferences on what they buy in the future. So if you wanted to use this kind of framework to, to work out, so, okay, so what's the implication? It's at a high level, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, easy. For instance, if you took the two mega trends, great expectation on the one hand and virtually here. So you say from great expectations, consumers are expecting a higher degree of personalization. Everybody wants a product that's just for, fit for themselves. Right? They're willing to pay a premium you know, if it's customized you know, for their own uh, specific needs. And then if you add you know, that digital and physical convergence in a, a trend, then here you know, you're looking at the opportunity to challenge businesses to customize the offering in a very, very different way. So I'll just uh, have a very quick discussion about mass customization. Not saying that that's, uh, you know, that, that is applicable to a lot of Austrian firms, but certainly when you begin to think like that, then you begin to think about you know, how you, know, uh, you might go about uh, doing, doing things. Right? So in an increasingly connected and networked world, so what firms need to do is to understand response to consumer uh, needs uh, much more quickly, much more quickly than they currently do. I mean, that speed, it's, uh, there are two aspects to speed. One is about you know, how quickly you get a product you know, out to market. The other one is actually how you could respond quickly in you know, consumer demand uh, in, in the first place. Following from that then is about your ability to personalize offerings to meet uh, the specific needs you know, of, uh, for consumers. Then it's got an implication then for the way that you operate your business. Uh, you, you know, manufacturing, particularly when you're looking at commodity manufacturing, used to be just you know, economies of scale. And, and uh, Joran mentioned now, you know, there's, the, there's the other concept, economies from scope. So economies of scale is about reducing unit costs uh, through re replication, duplication, as much as you can you know, produce high volumes and reduce costs. Whereas for a lot of firms in Australia, they, they don't have scale in the first place. So it's not as if you, know, you, can, you can produce high volumes uh, you know, to reduce your unit costs and get those efficiencies. So what do you do? Perhaps the other paradigm here is you know, the ability to customize, to meet very specific uh, you know, uh, consumer requirements. But on the other hand, customization is often expensive. So you know, to actually do different things for different people can be very, very expensive. So you know, where's the happy uh, medium there? So that's this movement you know, probably started about 10, 15, um, concepts started about 30, 30 odd years ago, but certainly there's a lot of discussion around mass customization. It's already, it's already a fact you know, in a number of uh, industries, but is this you know, where the happy medium is? You see all these uh, you know, websites where you can actually order your personalized you know, shoe, personalized chair, and so on. So, so there, is, there are businesses operating you know, on that model, uh, you know, some successful and some not so. So really, uh, mass customization is really just about finding that uh, balance where traditionally, if you're looking at uh, customizations but providing choice through diversity and personalization, but quite often you know, that comes at a high cost. Tailoring, for example. So you know, a tailored, you know, custom tailored suit is more expensive than a mass produced uh, suit unless you go to Thailand and you get it at a quarter of the price. Right. So then on the other hand, you know, uh, mass production is all about you know, replication and, and trying to reduce uh, the, the, the unit price. If you could actually do both, provide that personalization and then produce it at a, at, uh, as though you have economies of scale, then you might be, might be finding a happy medium there. And it goes to this whole um, concept that in Australia, perhaps for a lot of manufacturing firms, the future is about you know, low volume, high value uh, manufacturing. So out of all uh, you know, this mega trend analysis, we did some work a couple of years ago uh, in, the, in, in the manufacturing task force, and you see a range of implications for, uh, for manu manufacturing. 
And from there, you can also begin to unpack in a number of technology trends as well. But we will just uh, summarize, you know, we, we just put this together, you know, some, what are the factors, you know, that will contribute to a sustainable and competitive manufacturing uh, industry of the future. I think sustainability uh, in terms of environmental performance, you know, social license to operate, speed and agility, uh, I think is becoming much more important. You know, Yoran makes a good point, depends, depending on the size of your firm, you know, there's that balance as well, you know, on whether or not you, you know, agility is going gonna, is gonna to help. But I think more and more for smallish, mid-sized firms, you know, who have to uh, respond to very dynamic markets and, uh, you know, uh, rapidly changing you know, consumer sentiments and all that, then having the ability, you know, to, to change what they do and scale up and scale down, that's probably going to be important. So that leads to the scalability uh, factor. Of course, you know, future manufacturing is advanced manufacturing is going to be smart. Um, services are going to be much more uh, important in the future. You're seeing that trend shifting already. In Australia's context, uh, uh, we keep losing the value-adding battle. So um, I think uh, Australia's going to make a decision at some point, you know, are we going to be serious about value-adding you know, uh, to some of our natural resources you know, or not? I mean, that's a decision that's got to be made. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Australian manufacturers need to be uh, very well linked into global supply chains. So if you look at technology trends, it took me a long time to get to the topic. <laughs> um, so we just did a bit of a survey. Uh, you know, you pick uh, you know, all the usual, you know, uh, usual sources of reference here. You compile you know, all the um, types of technologies that people think are relevant for future manufacturing. There's not, not a lot of um, controversy here. You know, most of it is fairly consistent across a whole range of sources. Personal, personalization of IT, you know, things like wearable electronics, Google, Google Glass, you know, flexible watches. That's, you know, that's a very uh, major trend. It's a multi-billion dollar market, as some people will, will, will have you believe it, and it's probably true. Uh, biotech, genomics, medical devices, uh, big data and analytics, that's another area. Uh, advanced materials, of course, you know, uh, you know, I think will play a very, very big role in the future. Uh, things like you know, nanotechnologies, carbon fibers, you know, flexible electronics, and, and, and the like. Um, and also, you know, uh, new production processes, you know, cloud computing services, and so on. So if you look across the board there, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of agreement about what, uh, what those future technology trends uh, uh, are and what might be relevant you know, for firms to, you know, to embrace. So, Future manufacturing, you know, moving from lean, you know, to agile, you know, to, uh, to an information kind of driven uh, scenario. So I think, I don't think, I don't think a lot of people are going to kind of dispute that. We need to address our systems productivity. I think to maximize productivity, you need a systems or systems or solution. What we're finding uh, at, at the moment is that there, there are quite a lot of uh, areas where you can actually uh, improve productivity uh, significantly, not only at the factory level, but you know, acro across at enterprise level and across supply chain levels, for instance. There's an area that we've uh, identified, which is the hidden cost of you know, manufacturing. It's just the way that companies exchange data across the supply chain. And that actually, result, actually uh, has a very significant uh, level of cost associated with it. You know, a lot of things are done on paper, paper is exchanged, you know, mistakes are made, and so on. Purchase orders are you know, generally not done electronically. So there's a whole host you know, of uh, issues out there. These are the really hidden costs that if you actually apply you know, better informatics, ICT, and so on, you'll actually be able to uh, lift productivity quite significantly. But what I'll do uh, in the next, uh, you know, next little bit is just go through a couple uh, of technologies that are likely to be uh, to, to be important. I mean, the first one, of course, is uh, 3D manufacturing. So can't escape the the hype. I shouldn't say it's hype. It's just a lot of publicity uh, around 3D manufacturing. So you, you see it almost every day, uh, and we've actually followed the news. You know, CSRO has done uh, quite a number of interesting things. We actually printed, uh, the other day, we actually printed a, a, a titanium you know, shoe you know, for, a, for a horse. Uh, now, that's just an example of uh, something, that, uh, something that you do that you can personalize you know, a particular product you know, for, for, for a particular uh, user. But what 
uh, what it boils down to is, uh, does this uh, technology actually have any legs for industrial applications? So there's no doubt that uh, additive manufacturing can do a lot of weird and wonderful things. Question is whether it's going to be cost effective, whether it's going to be robust, whether it's actually going to be a sound value uh, business proposition uh, for manufacturers. What it generally does is that it can improve your resource efficiency. So for instance, uh, it's an additive process, you know, building materials layer by layer, and as opposed to a subtractive process where you take a block of metal and you begin to machine it. So you can actually uh, achieve a fair bit of resource uh, efficiency and as a result, you know, reduce uh, materials costs, can re reduce product costs. Um, more than that though, it provides a level of uh, flexibility that allows the manufacturer to do a couple of other things. One is that it can reduce the cycle time from design to market quite significantly. So for instance, if you want to build a metal component, you don't have to build a mold and then do the casting. You can actually build it up almost free form and you can do it in a very significantly reduced amount of time. Now that actually allows manufacturers to prototype and trial and do low, low production runs very, very, very efficiently. You can actually reduce the amount of investment you know, in the R&D uh, and, and development part uh, of, a, of a process uh, as well, depending on the technique uh, that you're using. But to become competitive, you can't actually generalize the benefits uh, you know, that you get from additive manufacturing. It's got to be done almost on a part-by-part -part, uh, basis. So quite often, additive manufacturing is touted as the, you know, the solution for everything, but that's not the case. Uh, it works for certain applications, and in other applications, totally you know, not cost-effective. And I think that's one of the traps when you look at uh, you know, whether or not this technology is going to be pervasive you know, in manufacturing. I think people need to get a much, much, much better understanding of you know, what those different uh, techniques are and you know, what uh, products will actually benefit uh, from the use of those techniques. And generally, there are two different types of techniques. You might know uh, one relates to polymers and one relates to uh, metals. So it's just a picture of you know, some additive manufacturing machines. And uh, when uh, Yoran was talking about black factories, I mean, here, here we have a scenario for factories of the future. And I've been one, uh, to one of them uh, in, in, in the States where they have fused deposition modeling. You have a hundred of these machines, the one in the middle, you have a hundred of them. There are only four people on the factory floor. It's not, a, it's not going to be a big source of employment. But what happens is that they've got about 40 other people uh, you know, in the background doing designs and all the ICT stuff and so on. But the actual uh, workers on the production floor itself is fairly limited. Right? So all they do is you, know, you have data files coming in from all over the place. They drag and drop. You know, the machine hums away six, 12 hours later. You know, open up the machine, take out a part, clean it, and then UPS, uh, you know, uh, down the road will actually send it to to uh, send it worldwide. So that's a scenario of factory of the future. It's a very very different scenario from the one you know that we that we currently know. Um, and all you have is just all these machines silently churning away with very little human intervention. So uh, Yoran's point is very well made. You know, human beings are there to help the machines, rather, rather than the other way around. But, the, but where the human uh, you know, a component comes in is perhaps you know, the, the knowledge creation part of it you know, in terms of uh, doing designs and, and then the servicing you know, of, the, of the products that come out from uh, the other end. So just a very quick uh, you know, example on uh, additive manufacturing. So I use the term additive and, manu uh, and subtractive right, to show that one is one where you add layers and the other one is where you machine things away. So here we have two examples, you know, both are re resulting in the same part. And this is an aerospace uh, engineering example uh, with titanium. And they have this term they call fly-by ratio. So when you have um, for one part that flies, you know, how many parts you have to buy in the first place. So for this particular component, the fly-by ratio using subtractive man uh, manufacturing is about 11 to 1. So you know, you've got to get about 11, 11 uh, units of the material. After machining, you only get one part that actually flies. Whereas with the additive uh, manufacturing approach using uh, powder or wire, the fly-by ratio is 1.3 to 1. So basically for one part that flies, you only wasted 0.3. Whereas in the other case, for one part that flew, you wasted 10. So that is where the massive, massive uh, you know, uh, implications are. But then it also has a skills implication here. Don't need machinists anymore. 
So, so, so in order to do the same thing, what are the skills you know, that we're going to need uh, in the future? And the skills here are relating to pretty much just pushing the button on the machine. That's radical. When you think about you know, how a technology that's highly productive can totally uh, alter you know, your skills uh, requirement. But that's just a very, very simple example, but a pretty obvious one, I would have thought. And that's something hopefully you'll provoke a little bit of uh, discussion because it actually goes to, in the future, you know, uh, what, uh, what sort of people do we train? Simply because that particular type of skill will appear to be no longer relevant if you were to substitute you know, a conventional machining you know, approach with, uh, you know, with, uh, with additive manufacturing. How am I going for time? Five minutes? Sure. Oh, all right, okay. You can go on. <laughs> so the other, major, uh, the other major technology platform that I'd like to talk about a little bit is automation. This is not about robots taking over human beings uh, you know, per se. I think one of the things that strikes a lot of fear <laughs> into manufacturing when you talk about uh, you know, workforce and, work and, 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 and employment is that you, know, you put in uh, you know, robots and they're just going to you know, take up all, the, all, all the, uh, the work that's done by human workers. I think when it comes to repetitive uh, work and work that can be dangerous, uh, that's ab absolutely a, a place for uh, industrial robots, and robots are becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And there's a lot of work that human beings don't want to do anyway, you know, things that are going to give you RSI and so on. So there's a time and a place, uh, there's a place for industrial robots. They're becoming more affordable, but you'll find that a lot of small manufacturers still struggle a little bit, you know, with the cost of implementing, uh, you know, industrial ro robotics. What we're talking about here is a whole generation of what we call assistive automation. So this is not about uh, robots that replace human beings, but this is about robotic and automation systems that complement and augment uh, human beings. So they are, you know, uh, assistive lifters, you know, the augmented reality devices and so on. This is not yet a very well uh, defined uh, area, but I think it's going to become uh, more and uh, more important. So, so these are automation systems that make the workplace safer, they improve productivity by, you know, by, helping, uh, you know, uh, by, by, by helping people rather than uh, replacing people. Our interest in the area um, started a few years ago uh, when, when, we, when, when we were looking at uh, you know, how are we going to apply our assistive automation uh, you know, technology to assist with uh, you know, worker productivity? And there was a line of thought there that, particularly with the aging population you know, in, this, in this country, um, the argument is that you can retain them in productive work for as long as possible. They'll actually reduce the cost of uh, healthcare, you know, keeping them as uh, active and healthy as possible. And also it's a way of retaining knowledge and skills for as long as possible. But, uh, you find that uh, in many cases, uh, you know, the, the, the mental ability may be still there, but the physical ab ability may, may, may not. So then what is the scope here of uh, actually uh, introducing assistive automation you know, to assist uh, you know, aging uh, workers to be uh, as productive as they can? So that's one, uh, one line of thinking. So there's a whole bunch of technologies there. I won't go through all of them, and I think I might have actually mentioned it in the, in the publication anyway. So the high-performance workplace uh, of the future, while it's not all about technology per se, because high-performance uh, workplaces are equally about you know, people, the way they are managed, you know, leadership and, 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 and all that, but technology certainly uh, can play a major role. So if you look at the uh, example in the top uh, left-hand corner, here we have uh, an, an aircraft maintenance company uh, in Queensland where the supervisor is actually somewhere else uh, supervising you know, a person on the hangar floor. So this is, uh, this is a case where you are actually using technology without actually having people to be all at the same place at the same time. And it's pro potentially a way to actually maximize the use of your skilled labor. For instance, you know, if you have a maintenance issue you know, in, in the eastern states and the, if the expert happens to be in West Australia, you can actually just beam, beam the person in and using all this fancy you know, headgear and so on, which actually tells you how to manipulate things. 
that you can actually have a potential here to maximize you know the utility you know of your your skilled uh, workforce wherever you are and we're actually getting a lot of companies now interested where if they are exporting a complex piece of equipment you know to another part of the world they want systems like this so that then they can actually carry out remote uh, maintenance so you can actually have the expert in australia without having to fly them in you just have a low level technician somewhere in you know africa or wherever and you can actually beam the expert in and actually get maintenance work done, and that will actually reduce uh, downtime. Uh, so that's, that's uh, one, one option. The aircraft uh, example they're seeing there, that's, a, that's an image achieved using that little uh, thingy on the... I, uh, coming from CSRO, I shouldn't use language like this, isn't it? <laughs> Should be, be more technical and specific. Yeah. Okay. So that's a, uh, that device on the bottom right hand corner is a 3D scanning device. It's called a Zebedee, and, and you may have heard about it recently. It's very famous. It won the Eureka Prize, and you know they've scanned the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and they've uh, they've done a lot of uh, wonderful things with it. But what happens there is that uh, this is a device where you just walk around, and basically it gets a real time 3D uh, image of the surroundings without any reference points. So basically, you don't actually have to fix any reference points. It, it basically builds that image as it goes. And, and uh, people are now looking at how you can use a mapping system like this to keep track of movement and objects on a factory floor. Right? So that's another example. So the whole purpose there is you know, improve efficiency, you know, improve safety, and so on. So those are just a couple of examples where advanced you know, ICT technologies can actually lead to a much more productive workplace. Then there are, so there are skills implications here as well. Right? The first one uh, with uh, that remote uh, supervision is very obvious. Right? You can actually make use of a smaller pool uh, of experts. And you can also be actually leveraged for training purposes. So you know, how do you actually do uh, improved training you know, from a distance uh, using uh, augmented reality? The second one also has uh, you know, uh, implications you know, for how you might organize you know, your factory floor, you know, the level of supervision you require, and also the, the ability to actually get information in real time for factory supervisors you know, to actually manage an operation. So I'll finish off with uh, the, the third, I guess, major kind of uh, you know, uh, technology uh, platform. This relates to, you know, uh, network-enabled manufacturing. So without going into too much detail, I guess it's that convergence between you know, robotics, you know, human-machine interfaces, informatics, and perception. So this is something, you know, the, the, you know, the, in the internet of things, you know, the way that all you know, devices kind of connect to each other. Uh, we talked to a lot of major manufacturing firms that in spite of having very, very good products, they seem to suffer from very poor processes. So it's a bit like you know, um, a, a maker of, uh, doing, doing a trip in Germany, and you know, the maker of robots actually has, pretty, is, has very low levels of automation themselves. And you see major manufacturers of complex medical instrument, instruments that operate like a cottage industry, you know, where everything is still uh, handmade. So it's not so much what they make, but it's really how they make it that's the, that's the issue here, and there's a productivity uh, issue, I think. And you find, uh, we were just talking to a, a major multinational the other day, where they were lamenting the fact that their production process has been built up over about 50 years, just, just added stuff on. And they want to have a thorough rethink, particularly all the millions of bits of information that come from the, from the factory. And finding some way just to integrate them so that a factory manager can make decisions quickly. But so those are the sort of things that are happening out there where it opens up a huge amount of uh, you know, pos uh, potential you know, for, uh, for improvement. And then whether or not our workforce of the future you know, have the skills you know, to manage those systems, you know, to manage the data flows and so on, and to make decisions accordingly, I guess you know, that's another point that we should be uh, uh, discussing. Nah, that's all about R2D2, so I think I'll skip that one. <laughs> so, um, without uh, presuming uh, to kind of preempt you know, some of the thinking about uh, future skills, just a couple of slides uh, from the US Leadership Council where you know, employers have uh, nominated you know, some of the key skills that are required. And all I wanted to, to point to is that they've nominated a range of hard skills 
hard skills, you know, engineering and technical skills as being most important. And to Joran's point uh, earlier on as well, that there's a whole bunch of soft skills that are equally important. And the ability uh, to collaborate, for instance, is actually you know, a very, very important skill that needs to be developed if you know, our manufacturing firms are going to be you know, much more innovative and competitive. And I guess, you know, just to finish off with the thought that it's not just about uh, workers and their skills, but I think more importantly also is about our leadership and you know, having that, uh, that, the skill you know, to be you know, agile, you know, mindful and assertive and uh, design-led. So which I, won't, uh, I, I won't mention the word design more than once because I know the next speaker is going to talk about it. So I might just uh, kind of leave it at that. Uh, for now. Yeah, thanks. Because uh, Sam, I'm not going to use that slide, my last slide, because you're going to use it. Because okay. so it's you. yours. <laughs> okay, we'll just take five minutes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We've got five minutes for questions before we break for lunch. So any questions from the audience? We have our trained microphone people, one over there, one go to the other side. Any questions? Can, can you just go back two slides? And there's one that breaks my little heart here. That, one more. Nobody wants a physicist. <laughs> Only 10% of people want a physicist. And yet the physicist is your, in, if you realise it, is your most adaptable, technologically skilled worker. The physicist does not get any specific training. Instead, they get a mental toolbox of understanding the universe. And so my very first job, I was trained as a physicist, was to build, design and build a machine to work out the, the metallurgical properties of the steel that is in the Westgate Bridge and work out the fatigue life. And we can talk about that off the record if BHP representatives aren't here. <laughs> and so a physicist can do anything, and yet here they are saying, no, we don't want no physicists, we don't need none of, at all. Boo-hoo. Any questions from the audience? I've now started that off. One we over need, here, yes, yeah, coming we through. We don't need them, but we love them anyway. Yeah. You love them. We want them. Okay. Uh, somebody watching oh, and microphone up. Uh, Hello. Hello. Test, test, test. test How's it going, test. Paul? You yeah. Count to ten. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, keep going. Yes, six, seven, eight. Five, yeah, that's it. Eight. Okay, now you're there. Oh. <laughs> I've been watching the conversation also around 3D printing. Yeah. And as you say, the hype. And I've been wondering, well, what is the reality of that and how wide scale is that going to be? What's happening overseas and, and uh, where does Australia sit in comparison? All that in three minutes. All that in three minutes. And I'll use up one minute <laughs> by, by using, reading this article from the uh, Australian yesterday, <laughs> which says there's a company called sneakingduck.com. And what you do is you send them a photograph of yourself and then they put glasses on that photograph and then they will 3D print five sets of frames for you. And today, when not everybody's got a 3D printer, they'll courier it to you. In the future, they'll just email it to you, et cetera, et cetera. So over here. <laughs> so one of the surveys in my table there is the Gartner height curve. I'm not sure you, <laughs> you've actually read them. Uh, pretty, well, you know, uh, some people dispute the method of research behind the data, but you know, they have this height curve, goes up like that, comes down, and, and basically, you know, the height builds up, and then it reaches its peak, and then it comes down, and then if it ever rises again after that, then it's real, right? So uh, 3D printing is right at the top, you know, right, right now. So, so you, you're quite right in saying that there's a little bit of, um, uh, call it hype or call it overexcitement. The fact is that the technology is hugely exciting. You know? It's huge. Uh, it's got huge potential. Um, it is great for doing a lot of different things. You know, some people want to print pizzas for space missions. Some people want to print burritos. Someone had printed a piece of steak. I mean, our mantra is just because you can, you know, you know, should you really do it, you know, just because you can, you, 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 you maybe shouldn't do it. Um, there are many, many issues, uh, not the least that, you know, in an industrial setting, you know, you have issues like just quality assurance. So I always defy people to go and print a kitchen knife, you know, in their backyard and use it. So I, I think there's a reality check. Uh, for uh, industrial applications as to whether or not what you're doing is of a sufficiently high value uh, to make it viable because the, generally the printing speeds are relatively slow. 
Sometimes the materials that you get to use is fairly restricted because uh, some manufacturers lock up their machines so that you can only use certain types of materials. By and large, in a lot of materials and products, uh, the, the way in which the material gets built and the microstructure and properties and all that are not so well known. So for non-engineering applications, they're probably all right. But in a lot of engineering applications, a lot of research is still being done. So you find that you know, in America, for instance, you know, the, 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 at, 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 you know, at once manufacturing institutes have been set up, you know, a lot of money is, uh, is being invested. I think Australia is uh, a bit behind, it's quite far behind. Uh, we, we're not going to have. We don't seem to be building up a scale here, uh, you know, where you have enough companies out there that can form, you know, uh, an industry. I think there'll be areas in uh, niche applications. You know, I think that we can do very well. For instance, in CSRO, we've got a program around uh, additive manufacturing of titanium. Kind of makes sense because you know we've got a technology that makes titanium powder in the first place, and you can put cheap powder into the machine and make value-added products. Then it makes sense. I think there's a lot of scope in biomedical uh, implants, for instance. So this is an interesting question about whether you've got a comparative advantage or, or in fact, whether you have a comparative disadvantage or not in the first place. It doesn't appear that we have a comparative disadvantage to take it up. We're going to have a big broadband infrastructure. You know, people are going to be, trying to be able to transfer files you know, all over the place. question is just, again, you know, uh, can you make a business proposition out of it? But that one you can't generalize. You almost have to, you know, pick it part by part. For instance, uh, using the same machine and the same materials, certain products are more cost effective than others. So it's a kind of a long-winded way of answering your question. I hope I hope that answers your question a bit. <laughs> <laughs>